Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, we tell you how artificial intelligence is not only helping scientists develop new drugs against the virus, but also how it's helping to predict the most severe cases of COVID-19 by sifting through large amounts of medical and scientific data and finding patterns. And in Test 24, Dan and Jay Cattlecar will take an online chess course. Isaac Asimov would be surprised to see how helpful robots are turning to be during this global pandemic. They've been used for a variety of reasons worldwide, from delivering groceries to taking temperatures and disinfecting public spaces. Peter O'Brien has the story. They're called starships. And although they might look extremely menacing, they're nothing to do with an alien invasion. This shop in Washington, D.C. can no longer serve customers on site, so it's using these cute little pods to deliver groceries. See Amelia? Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Well, we get the orders um, on the phone, so we fill the bags um, in the shop, and then the Starship dispatchers load the robots and dispatch. Say bye-bye, Amelia. Bye-bye. Say thank you to the robot. I actually think so. Thank though. you, robot. Elsewhere in the US, it's bigger brothers on the loose. This autonomous shuttle's being used in Florida to move COVID-19 tests from one clinic to another. Other medical needs are being robotically serviced around the world. Indonesia, Thailand and Italy are all deploying androids to help out in hospitals. They've got a variety of tricks up their sleeves, from conveying messages between doctor and patient to checking temperatures and delivering food and medicine. All this helps lighten the load for medical staff while allowing them to keep a safe distance. It allows us to use less protective clothing, like masks and overalls, which at this time are in scarce supply. Elsewhere, robots are being used to disinfect public spaces, like this handy box on wheels in Singapore. But the most innovative use of our mechanical cousins so far has been in Tokyo. No, these students at their graduation ceremony aren't all worryingly skinny. They're just part machine, part video call. Artificial intelligence has clearly revolutionized many sectors, including research. In a recent report published by the WHO, the organization has shown how much China has used big data and artificial intelligence to drive its strategy against COVID-19. Now AI is also being used to try to predict the most severe cases of COVID-19. And to speak more about it, I'm joined by Dr. Barry from NYU and Dr. Megan Coffey. Well, thank you to the both of you for joining us here on Tech24. So you've been using AI and machine learning to try to identify the three top signs of patients who are likely to develop a critical illness. So tell us more about the project you're developing over at NYU and perhaps what you've discovered so far. Thank you, Julia, for having me. Our vision and goal were to design and deploy a decision support tool using artificial intelligence, mostly predictive analytics capabilities to flag clinical coronavirus severe cases. My general theory about artificial intelligence is that AI exists to serve as an extension and not as a replacement to human intelligence. Human judgment and creativity are needed more than ever in the applicability of AI. And that applies to the vision that we have for this AI project in New York University on applying AI as a decision support tool in healthcare. We want to create intelligent tools that could help doctors in their day-to-day -day work to make data-driven decisions. Uh, when cases started being reported in China, we predicted that the outbreak will spread across the world for the simple reason that now we can move from one side of the world to another in a matter of hours. And since early January, I've been co-leading uh, a multidisciplinary team uh, of computer scientists uh, at New York University Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences, 
doctors in the NYU School of Medicine, and together we partnered with two hospitals and doctors in Wenzhou, China. This is an ongoing research and development work where we collected historical, anonymized, and private patient data that encapsulates demographics, clinical, laboratory, and radiological data points that were ingested into our algorithm. And the purpose was to predict and score patients who might develop a severe case, specifically a severe respiratory syndrome known as ARDS. The predictions are mainly based on learned patterns from past experience and past data, and we took a different approach where we wanted to flag severe cases because we believe that that could help save saving lives, lower emergency uh, visits, and help doctors make decisions on resource allocation, especially that now we have limited equipment across the world in ventilators, oxygen, hospital beds, masks that are basically being limited. Uh, while our tools still need further validation and refinement, we believe that it holds the potential as another predictive analytics tool to help predict uh, patients that are most vulnerable to the virus. We started collaborating with a third hospital in China, and we're looking into two others in New York City. Uh, AI and predictive analytics departed the field of science fiction, and I believe that this is the time we need to come as one community of clinical doctors, AI experts, to work hand in hand to put in place an infrastructure, not just in the US, but globally to be able to predict, isolate, as well as respond to this outbreak and future outbreaks before they become a pandemic. Hi, I just want to stress what Professor Bari has been saying, and that I would look at this as a proof of concept. I wouldn't take home from this that these are three signs that you can use at home to try to identify whether you're going to be at risk of developing coronavirus uh, and a severe case of it. Instead, what I would say is that uh, we've been able to show kind of this proof of concept that patients on the first one, two, three days who are doing fine sometimes have a signal or just some characteristic in their labs, in their symptoms, that in some way can identify that they are going to be more likely to develop more severe disease later on. In our case, we were using lab values and some symptoms. Uh, we can also use vital signs. You can use uh, history of using certain medications or certain medical conditions. And then just using that in terms of a decision tree where it's, if this factor, then this factor. And if this factor is true, then this factor. And so I wouldn't look at any of these pieces or any of these signs on their own in isolation. Instead, it's an algorithm that needs to have all of these pieces together to help identify who may be at more risk. Moreover, it could be different in different populations. Uh, in different places, people may come into care later than in other places. So we may be having people on day one, day two in some places, and day five, day seven in other places. Well, thank you to the both of you for speaking to us here on Tech24. Thank you. And let's now welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello, Dan. Hi, Julia. So tell us more about how supercomputers and AI are being used in the fight against COVID-19. Well, first of all, a supercomputer is a very powerful, high-performance machine that is made of hundreds and in some cases thousands of processing units. Typically, supercomputers are used in the field of climate science, astronomy, and medicine. For COVID-19, supercomputers are being used to identify drug compounds that can neutralize the new coronavirus. In this regard, the world's fastest supercomputer, Summit, ran thousands of simulations of different compounds and identified 77 of the most promising molecules. These simulations were done by using the computational model of the interaction between the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and the human ACE2 cell receptor. The simulations identified those compounds which can attach to the spike protein and prevent it from infecting the human cell. It's time now for Test 24. Thanks, Julia. I've been getting some very useful tips from Grandmaster Daniel King, who is a chess trainer, commentator, author, and who also hosts a popular channel on YouTube called Powerplay Chess. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us on Tech24. Hi, Don and Jay. Now, continuing our discussion about playing solid with black pieces, what is your opinion about the Karakhan defense? Great opening. Really like the Karakhan. As black, you play solidly. You have this very nice pawn structure, uh, which is 
seems a little bit backward, but actually if White presses too hard, then you can hit them with a counter-attack. So, yeah, I like the carrot. Now, talking about technology and chess, how has technology transformed chess over the past two decades or so? I guess uh, the software we are using, ChessBase 15, is a good example of it, right? Yeah, I mean, ChessBase were a pioneer in developing this kind of software, which allows you to study chess very well using databases of past games. But of course, more than that, it's connected the whole world so that if you're in Alaska, you can play against someone in Australia online or, you know, every single corner of the globe is connected. And that's led to the development of chess. But of course, not just online, but, you know, using chess engines um, because well, there was the famous match in 1997 between Kasparov and Deep Blue. And after Kasparov was beaten, everyone said, oh, what's the point of playing against computers? Well, now we work with chess computers to develop the game. And it's led to really you know, new strategies in the game. And far from being dead, the game of chess has really taken off and is alive, actually. Now, from IBM's Deep Blue to DeepMind's AlphaZero, why has chess been used as a testing ground for new computing technologies whose applications are clearly beyond chess? Well, I mean, right from the early days of um, computing, the development of, of computing, chess has always been used as, as, as a testing ground because it has a, a very clear objective, checkmate, the moves, the rules are very clear, and it's a, it's a limited space, 64 squares, 32 pieces, but the possibilities are limitless, and that is perfect for computing. And now with machine learning, I mean, really, in the past couple of years, chess strategy has been revolutionized. And, and what is the incredible thing about machine learning is that it has given a kind of flexibility to uh, technology. Whereas before, these first chess engines were brilliant at playing chess, but it was very difficult to apply that te technology to other fields. Whereas with machine learning, well, they're brilliant at chess, but they were immediately able to apply that to other complex fields and notably uh, in, in medicine, for example, and that's used right now, right today, for example, in uh, the best eye hospital in London is using machine learning uh, as a diagnostic tool, but, but in many other areas of research. So it, it's, it really has, well, not just transformed chess, but is in the process of transforming our world. Well, fascinating stuff indeed, Daniel. Thank you very much. And thanks also for bolstering my confidence to play the Karakan. You're welcome. Back to you, Julia. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. You can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you soon and stay safe.